Hey everybody, it's uh, Rob with Adbutler here. Welcome back to another version of uh, AdTech Unscripted. Today I'm joined by Dan. He's the founder and CEO over at Admiral. Uh, previously, Dan, you spent decades in, in venture capital, um, mostly with media publishers, uh, which I guess led you to creating Admiral and helping media publishers. Uh, so Dan, welcome, welcome. We're, we're excited to have you. Um, uh, before we get you. into... Yeah, thank you. Before we get into all of the questions I'm going to throw at you, maybe you want to quickly introduce yourself and tell everybody about uh, who you are. You know, give us the long story. Who Who is Dan and how did you get to where you are today? Uh, sure, sure. So, uh, you know, I mean, you you did a great summary there, but, you know, my background uh, early on, you know, undergrad, I was uh, computer engineering, right? So in part of the Apple II generation, so just really fired up about startups and, and how Apple is created. Um, I ended up going, I, I guess, to work with one of Apple's arch enemies, IBM, in the early days and kind of learn from a blue chip. Uh, then got excited about startups and venture capital and did grad school and actually went into venture capital uh, and uh, and launched a couple funds. There's a West Coast fund called Draper Fisher Jurvetson that we launched in the East Coast. Two funds there, about 30 companies, and then built enough of a track record of my own to launch a third fund uh, focused mostly on the Southeast U.S., and uh, did another 10 companies there. In the process, we were backing a bunch of software uh, and media companies. And, and one of the last companies I backed uh, was called Groove Shark in the music streaming space. And so it was a, a media publisher. It was ad supported, subscription supported, um, really the pioneer of music streaming. But, but we stumbled onto something there uh, because uh, music enthusiasts were some of their earliest ad block adopters. Uh, and there's this, mm. you know, Adblock is just tip of the spear of this broader kind of privacy user empowerment wave that's bulldozing through the category. And so when we sold off Groove Shark to the labels, we actually spun the product team out to create Admiral uh, to help all publishers uh, build relationships with their visitors and uh, and ultimately, you know, figure out the right value exchanges for a sustainable internet. That's awesome. I was. I was an avid fan of Groove, Groove Shark back in the day, so it's it's super interesting to you know to 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 see you on the show because I, I had no idea you were involved with it. Um, I, I really it's, lucked into it. It's interesting. The music, um, the music revolution is actually analogous to some of the stuff that's going on in media publishing. So, I, so I I put the first money into Napster, which was like the first bookend <laughs> of the music yep. revolution, and then the other bookend was Groove Shark. In between those two, it was you know almost a couple decades of the music industry coming to terms with how users wanted to consume music, and and it took yeah. the labels a long time to figure that out, and they lost revenue in the process, and ultimately got got back around to it with with streaming and ultimately Spotify. Uh, publishers, whether they realize it or not, are going through the same sort of cycle with users and privacy and ad blocking and kind of the revolution that users again are trying to take the internet where they want it to go, how they want to consume. And publishers ultimately have to kind of get ahead of that curve instead of playing catch up. Um, and, and hopefully it doesn't take publishers, you know, a decade plus the way it took uh, the, the music labels. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully not. Um, it's interesting you say that ad block is, is definitely, you know, Ad builder being an ad server is definitely something we deal with here all the time. And, you know, people people bring that up to us and we're like, you know, 40 percent of our users are getting bought by ad blocker and we're charging CPM. So we're losing revenue on things like that. Right. Uh, and there's definitely some some technical workarounds, you know, that, that people can do with server side ad injection and, and things like that. But um, how does how does Admiral kind of fit into the picture? What uh, what do you guys offer you know, in terms of being able to 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 help publishers, you know, recapture some of that lost revenue that are that are you know um lost ad blockers yep so you know so we started out you know with like any good startup you know we had kind of a fairly narrow mvp in in the early days and that mvp product was really just size and solve ad block losses right ad block is one of those things because it also blocks your data calls it can screw up your google analytics it screws up comscore and nielsen and other things and so step one was just to help people realize that their normal dashboards aren't even showing them an accurate picture of, of what's going on. And so we, we had this free tag. We said, listen, stick this tag on your site and we'll immediately tell you how much you're losing to ad block. 
whether you do anything with us or not, you should at least understand, you know, the, the implications. Then if you want to get some of that revenue back, we can help you do it. Um, but we kind of came at it a little differently than, than the rest of the market. So as you mentioned, there was definitely a, kind of a group of players that were trying to like sneak ads past the blockers, right. Or, or circumvent the blockers or what have you. Um, there's another group that was trying to, in a different way, sneak ads past the blockers. And, and essentially what they've done is, you know, they put the acceptable ads moniker on it, but they essentially have put out ad blockers that by default opt you into seeing ads, which is uh, kind of controversial in the category that you're, you're marketing an ad blocker that by default um, shows you ads. So it's a different way of seeking yeah. ads past the blockers. But we went a different direction, which we said, you know, what's the, what's the root cause of the problem here? Um, and what we came away with was as an industry for a couple of decades, um, publishers didn't need any sort of relationship with their visitor. And so they just attach ads to the content. And if the content's good enough, you know, they have a business. As a result, you don't have a relationship. And so each side can abuse the relationship, right? Publishers may abuse right. the relationship with a bad ad experience and users may abuse it with blockers and other things. And so we say, well, wait a minute, you know, this isn't just about ad block. Ad blocking is just a symptom of the lack of relationship between publisher and visitor. And so when we look at, you know, whether it's ad blockers or data blockers, or now what's coming with death of the cookie and GDPR and CCPA, those are all the same wave. And that same wave goes back to this idea that publishers that create relationships with their visitors are going to separate themselves from publishers that don't over the next decade. And so we ultimately built a platform, you know, first at MVP was size and solve ad block losses, but it's grown into this bigger thing that we call visitor relationship management, which is how do you help publishers create one-to-one you know, visitor relationships and first party data and relationships with their visitors. Right. Yeah. There's a lot to unpack there. And I'm going to go back maybe four or five sentences to this idea of acceptable ads. <laughs> um, it's always been one of these things in the back of my mind where so there's a certain certain uh, ad blockers that exist in the market where you can essentially pay to get your ads still seen. Right. And it's always like uh yeah <laughs> is that really ad blocking to the to the way that you expect ad blocking to work like yeah yeah i can i can get myself whitelisted and, and it's an acceptable ad and now it's getting past the ad blockers so yeah at, at some point i felt I, I feel like certain ad blockers went from having a very good mission and and, and pure heart thing that's like hey let's just stop stop you know stop ads and things like that and then they saw a revenue opportunity they're like well you know what we can make money uh, uh we can we, we can make money on this by letting people whitelist themselves and paying us a bunch of money right what what are your thoughts on that whole acceptable ads like i'm not i'm not trying to trash talk it by any means because yeah. in, in some regards it works works really well um but what are your thoughts around acceptable ads and like the ability for people to to get boss ad past ad blockers by paying the ad block company themselves right what are your yeah, thoughts so, on that yeah so you know i think there's been a, a, a an, an evolution um at least in the messaging of it uh, i think i think uh, io who's the largest ad block company out there kind of try to get smarter at how they market what they're doing uh, you know right. when, when they first came out with it uh the iab uh, i think it was randall rothenberg was 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 on the record saying this is an extortion business model, right? This is you that's know, what I was referring to. I just didn't want to say it, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they, you know, they tapped the publisher on the on the shoulder and say, "Hey, you know, if you cut us in on the action, we'll let some of your ads show." And yeah, and take away all the marketing. That's essentially what is happening. Okay, so yeah. so IO goes to market with that concept, and and they get lambasted by publishers in the industry. And so what they did was they said, well, we need to separate ourselves from that a little bit. And so they kind of empowered what you might call tax collectors to like go out and do it for them under other brand names. So it's not right. IO, 
but it is these other company names that are out there, you know, tapping people on the shoulder and saying, hey, um, you know, if you got us <laughs> in on the action, we're going to let some of your ads through. Gonna, yeah, so, so, um, yeah, it's funny. The model still hasn't changed that much. It's just, yeah, yeah, the messaging. Exactly, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, so I think they've gotten better at at marketing it. Um, you know, the the problem for publishers is that it ultimately is like, you know, remnant uh, ad. You know, from an RPM standpoint, it's it's just it's just bottom of the barrel. And so, right for someone who kind of is trying to like check the box of like, oh, I did something about ad block. It's like, well, it's it's better than nothing. Um, yeah, but you're, you're, you're still not making paying the blockers. Um, yeah. But if you, if you think about anyone who who focuses on yield optimization, right, that remnant is just like the baseline. What you really want to do is get your premium on top, and so that's that's where the stuff we do around relationships and talking to users and getting blockers off. When you get the blocker off, it unlocks the full ad stack, and so you get the full RPMs. Um, and so in some sense, you can think of it as like, you know, so ours is called full stack recovery versus, you know, something like acceptable ads. And you can think of it as almost like multiple bidders f- for a blocker, right? For, 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 the, for the inventory of a blocker. And anyone who knows yield optimization, there's value in having multiple bidders. Like you'd never just run, you know, remnant inventory and not try to run some other bidders against it. Um, right. So, you know, we just bring, you know, higher RPMs. Um, with the, the last data, we just ran some data on this last data we had was, you know, RPMs anywhere from, you know, five to nine X um, from uh, full stack recovery versus. Uh, that's awesome. Except to add stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's super cool to hear. Um, <clears throat> so you, you have some other models too. You mentioned things, um, you know, so full stack. So beyond just like ad block recovery, what are some other, other ways publishers, that you've worked with can can help kind of i really like the idea of fostering that relationship with the viewer and with the reader right because it's there's there's nothing more annoying than going to a website and you know you're bombarded with ads it's a poor user experience you're just there to like read some trash on the internet and that's it and 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 honestly i load up some pages and i get hit with so many ads i'm like i'm not going back to this page no right it's just just not happening right um what do you, what do you find publishers? Cause I know that like there are certain, certain um, sites out there. They've got like subscription models, right. Where you can pay um, even our local newspaper here. I'm in Atlantic. Well, I'm in, in on the West coast right now, but typically I'm, I'm over in Atlantic Canada yeah. and, and the media publisher over here, like our newspapers, you pay, I think it's like a dollar 95 for a month and you can access all their articles and things like that. Um, and even then, you still see some some ads, right? You still see ads, right. um, but it's not an overwhelming experience. I'm happy to pay the money for it. You know, I rem- my first job way back when was a newspaper boy, right? Delivering newspapers and knocking on nice. doors, right? It's just, yeah. you know, uh, I used to pay like a dollar a week for newspapers and things, right? Um, so I don't mind paying a dollar ninety five to get access to read my you know local news every day. Um, but but what do you find publishers? What's working for publishers? What's not working? Like if you had to give recommendations, what uh, what what would you what would you recommend? Sure. So so again, we really do start from this this focus on the relationship, and so it helps us not to get too stuck in any one fiefdom, right? Like like publishers right. get yep. stuck with these fiefdoms, right? They've got their ad ops team, they got All their the subscriptions time. team, they got their email guy that has a list of 10,000 emails and, and they're like fighting for resources and, and yep. we're a little more focused on, on the entire relationship. And so, um, you know, just to list off some of the things that we think are part of relationships, uh, you know, uh, talking about ad block, that's a simple one. You get ad blockers off, that's immediate revenue. Um, but then, you know, in starting an email relationship with someone, uh, turning that into a registration, right? Which then you can start to have an account, uh, which has first party data attached to that account. Um, moving into things like uh, following on social, uh, downloading of mobile apps, um, donating, like, a, like you know, Patreon sort of donations, uh, subscriptions, right. uh, and then ultimately privacy consent, like GDPR and CCPA. So all of those things are part of what it means to have a relationship, right? If you can talk to somebody about one of those things and they will opt into that, they're stepping into the relationship, uh, leaning in a little bit. Um, 
So ultimately you want to do all of that. But the reality is like, you know, you only do a step at a time. And so, you know, what yeah. we promote is, you know, put our free tag on, on page. You'll immediately see like what revenue opportunity exists across these various buckets. And then you can turn on any of them that you want to without writing a single line of code. And so you may turn on ad block recovery and then you may say, oh, well, let, I'd love to get some email addresses as well. Let's, let's click on getting email addresses. And then ultimately, you know, you, let's turn on subscriptions. And, you know, we can kind of power all of that for them. Depending upon the, the philosophy of the publisher, you know, some of them right. maybe may have a subscriptions mindset. And so they definitely want to launch that. And some of them may specifically not have a subscriptions mindset. And they want to stay more in the kind of free access uh, world. We happen to feel that there is no one silver bullet on any right, of these. Yeah. It is you have a diverse audience that all is open to different value exchanges, right? You, you can have the exact same site, the exact same article, but two different people show up, and one of them is okay with an ad supported experience, and another one wants ad free, and they're willing to pay for it. And so you need a platform. They can allow you to meet people where they're at uh, and ultimately maximize what, you know, we focus on average revenue per user or ARPU, right? Um, right. Okay. So, you know, there's some folks out there, you know, you ask specifically about subscriptions. There's some folks that kind of have blinders on about subscriptions. And so everything they do is ultimately about how do they try to get a subscriber. Right. But in reality, you know, at best, you're going to hit 5% of your, your users or subscribers, or, or if you absolutely blew it out of the water, top tier, you know, at best 10% are paying subscribers. That means 90 to 95% of your visitors are not paying subscribers. And mm -hmm. so if, if you have blinders on about turning everyone to a subscriber, you're actually going to screw some things up with the other 90 to 95% yeah. versus yeah. figure out how to kind of grow relationship, grow ARPU uh, across the entire spectrum. Again, you know, someone goes from not being an email subscriber to being an email subscriber that causes them to read, you know, an extra article per week, which doubles their page views with you. You just doubled the ARPU of that visitor right. and, you, and, and they didn't right. have to pull a credit card out, right? You didn't, you didn't have to make that level of an ask, but over time, if they're an email subscriber and they turn off their blocker and they're a social follower, there's a decent chance they'll become a paid subscriber. So you just right. have to yeah. grow the relationship steps at a time. Yeah. And it, it's interesting you said there about, you know, um, that, that first party data aspect too. Is there anything that you found is like the most profitable or so, you know, in the, in the first party data world, it's, if I come to 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 a page and I give consent and and yes, or there's a sign up process and I'm signing up and I'm filling in my email address or maybe my date of birth and location and things. Yep. Um, is there anything that you would recommend is like the best for targeting you know options? So if you're running an ad campaign and, and relying on first party data, um, you know, is there anything that that works best? Do you find you know geo is more profitable than say contextual? Do you find no. And you, you might not have insights to this. I'm just really curious. But, you know, in terms of first party data and what the publisher shares, you know, I, I, along the, that, that supply chain, as it were, um, is there any sets of data that you find is trending right now that publishers should look at that maybe they aren't considering? Um, I don't know. If, I, I don't know if the top ones would be a surprise to everyone. You know, there's about there's about eight. We, we've done some work with some of our publishers and Kind of analyze all the bidding that's happened against their stack and therefore, you know, and what, what are the top data points that are used for campaigns? And there's about eight that, that we could all kind of guess on, right? It's, it's geo, it's gender, it's uh, household income, you know, those yeah. sorts of things. Um, that's for broad based, but, but then when, if, and when you have direct sales capabilities, it can be very narrow, specific to the advertiser you're thinking about, right? And so to the degree it's a, you know, an, an auto advertiser and you could pick up via a first party, you know, form or survey, you know, someone's preferences in cars or, you know, whether they're interested in fast cars versus family cars or what have you, like yeah. 
that data point is then really valuable in a direct sales uh, atmosphere or PMP atmosphere that's then going to push up your CPMs on those campaigns. So, so yes, there's you know maybe a top eight of just kind of like the core that everyone's bidding against, but yeah. uh, depending upon your niche, there, there's a bunch of additional first party that you can get that really pushes up your your CPMs. Yeah, one of the ones I've seen here kind of frequently is like uh, in in the in the real estate market, um, you know, like the number of bedrooms in a house or the number of of bathrooms and things like that, uh, where where the advertiser, um, you know, was 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 paying to get, uh, um, you know, pre- premium ad space for people looking for expensive houses, right, and stuff right. like that. So it's yes, yeah, it's really cool that 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 level of granularity can be used to to drive, you know, RPM and and in this case, yeah. you know, RPU or RPU. That's that's super cool. Yeah, um, and and I say sh- that you know, there's a there's a near term piece of this, and then there's the longer term piece of this, right? So when I talk about you know director PMPs. That, that's that's the near term piece because programmatic and cookies are still taking care of you on on third party programmatic targeting. But when we right. move beyond, uh, you know, when we get deprecation of third party cookies, and we get into a world of of seller defined audiences or, or or some sort of grouping of audiences or something, um, publishers really need to have their own data set. To date, they've been able to rely on the fact that. You know, if I come to a news site, but I happen to have previously visited a a running site, then it knows to show me, you know, a, a running shoe yeah. ad and the publisher, the news publisher benefits from that CPM. But to the degree that third part party connection gets severed, it's really mm-hmm. up to that news publisher to start to really understand who their visitors are. Um, and, uh, you know, this comes back to first party data. Uh, as well, in addition to the explicit or, or you know declared first party data like filling out forms or surveys, you also have the implied first party data. You know, one of the things where we've got a big ML project on is immediate classification off of content consumption. On you know, is somebody a Tampa Bay Bucks fan or are they uh, you know a, a, a hockey fan or, or what have you? So that out of the box, you have a first party representation of your um, visitor set. Yeah, that's super intriguing. We, we don't quite have the same model, the same ooh, struck my microphone. We don't quite have the, uh, the same, um, to, to, uh, I guess use case over here, you know, in, in the ad builder platform, but we have a, like a, a contextual management platform that we have in ad builder where, um, when a visitor comes to the page, we can we we read and we identify each page and we learn what that page is about and we fit it all into the IAB taxonomy for categories and keywords. Yeah. So a publisher can go in and get get a real time view of like um, how are ads doing based on specific IAB categories and things like that. So they can say, you know what, our, our users right now are digesting a lot of uh, news related uh, or or money and finance related and things like that. Yeah. So. I, f- I found the really cool thing there is then you can marry that data to first party to that the data that you have as well. So you can say like, great, uh, finance is currently doing really well on the East coast. So let's focus a lot of our content creation on finance articles targeted to, you know, specific geos and things like that. Right. So it's, it's really cool to see all of these, you know, different working pieces come together. And then, you know, so I'm, I, I, there's a soft spot in my heart for publishers. So it, it's really cool to see like publishers taking all of this kind of curated content or, or curated you know, uh, information and then building content for their, for their viewers. You know, it's really relevant to, um, to what they want to read. Right. So yeah. I, I love that. I love it. Yeah. And you're going to shift your, you know, to, you, you touched on the contextual aspect, but you're going to see this, this shift to where you need to be able to tie it to authenticated user. Uh, exactly. And on top of to authenticated user, you know, look like audiences to that yep. user. Um, and so, you know, we're just trying to help as much as much as we can. Our mission is saving the free internet one publisher at a time um, because I love all it. this wave of privacy and user empowerment is going to challenge publishers for, I love for a long that. while. Um, one publisher so- at a time, saving the free internet. I I 100% love that because um, I think we have the, the same the same mentality here. Um, yeah. Love. I, I love that idea. Um, nice. Shifting gears just slightly. Yep. Uh, I know we only have a, a little bit of time left, but um, I recently found out that your customer success team calls themselves the customer love team. Yeah. Uh, 
I love that. So I've 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 talked to other companies, you know, they called them like success gurus and things like that. Or uh, there was another one that had like, you know, customer ninjas and things, things along those lines. The customer love team. What's your story behind that? I, I love that idea. What, what made you come up with customer love or, or how did that happen? It, it, uh, it was a little organic. I mean, it, it really came out of the mentality of our company, right? So when you, when you try to mm-hmm. analyze, you know, what, what, what's core values of your company and, and what are the things that you're doing uh, naturally versus artificially, right? Like what's the DNA of your people? Uh, and, and customer love just, just shown through on that. If, if you talk to our customers, the term customer love will come up sometime in that conversation, right? And so back to, you awesome. know, it starts with our mission, saving the free internet, one publisher at a time. And then, you know, how are we doing that? Well, one of the ways we're doing it is just absolute care and love for our customer's success. Uh, one neat thing that we saw, so we did, we started that years ago. But then just in the last year, we we stumbled onto this book. I don't know if you've been exposed to it or not. It's called Winning on Purpose um, by uh, not. Fred Reicheld. And he um, uh, he was the guy who created a net promoter score. Uh, so he was at, uh, I believe, uh, Bain for a long while and created net pr- promoter score. Uh, and, and he's continued to refine it. Anyway, he writes this book. And um, like the subtitle of the book is The Unbeatable Strategy of Loving Customers. And he even uses the phrase customer love. So we got, we got all excited that like now you know, awesome. he's putting some science around you know, what, what we feel. And the whole message of it is that your happiness, right, your feeling of, of progress is defined by whether you are progressing the customer. Right. Is right. the customer better off um, both at a company level, but also the individual champion that you're working with? Right. Are they a hero in their organization because you're going it. overboard to try to make sure they're a hero in their organization? Yeah, I, I love that. that. And that was one of the things. So I, I come from a bit of a sales background before I stepped into like the the product and apparently the podcast role here at Butler. Yeah. Um, you know, in the sales point of view, it was always that in the, in the buying process, right. Um, people are always coming in and, you know, they're looking at pricing, looking at, but it, really at the, end of the, at the end of the day, there's, it's something very satisfying to that user to go back to stakeholders and say, Hey, you know, I, I closed the deal with, with ad I closed the deal with Admiral, I closed the deal with Google or whoever, by the way, I got us a 30% discount or I got us X, Y, and Z bonus, whatever. Like they feel like a hero. They look like a hero. Yeah. So empowering that one individual, uh, user or, or customer or, or whoever it is, the customer at that point, right? Yeah. Um, I, I love that you just said that because that's that's kind of exactly what I've learned in my experience. And I and and I've I've gone through some sales processes with our vendors where it's not like that at all. And you just kind of feel like you're almost a burden or you're just a number to them, right? As opposed to actually like like they're 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 trying to make you be successful. I have a toddler in the background screen, yeah. by the well, way. Well I I think uh <laughs> You know, back to how it started. Now that you say that, it reminds me that one of the reasons it started, again, we, you know, at Groove Shark, we were a media publisher. And so we had vendors coming to us right. all the time. And, and you know, you had the vendors that would say, hey, we'll promise you a, a $5 CPM. But it's all smoke yep. and mirrors because as soon as you put their thing on, they, they like do like 0.5% fill. And they're like, see, I, I got to the CPM. I was, cl-, and, and, and and all it really did was <laughs> just like took from another. I, I didn't gain any revenue in the process as a whole. Um, right. What you know, we were coming into a category that had some smoke and mirrors in it, right? And publishers yep. have been hardened from the, the smoke and mirrors in, in the <laughs> oh you know, man, no joke, Martech space. And so we just said, listen, we we want to be completely transparent on the customer side. Trying to trying to solve their problems, and if we do that, like we're gonna we're gonna be all right, and they're gonna be all right. Um, so yeah, yeah that, that that was a bit of the origin story. It's it's really served us well. The, the other thing, you know, we talk about we're the visitor relationship management company. It puts relationships front and center for us as a company, but but like more than a tagline, like relationships. We can think about as publisher visitor relationships, right? Our product does that. But mm-hmm. also our relationship with the publisher really matters, right? That's customer love. 
our relationship with visitors matter because our software is interacting with visitors and you know are are we doing it right are we doing it well and then lastly the relationship between our employees and, and admiral as a company all matter so we so relationships is this like awesome four circle yeah. venn diagram of like if we deliver on caring about relationships like we're, we're going to be okay yeah that's awesome i love it i love it um yeah i mean we're we're we're, we're up on the the 30 minute mark so we try to keep the the unscripted chats uh this is fun. around 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 this time yeah like i said we, we go into this and we have a rough idea of what we want to talk about and then we completely go off track and and here we are now um but i love it this whole conversation is great you know the whole purpose of these unscripted um podcast are to to bring in thought leaders from you know the ad tech industry the martech industry and 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 just get everybody kind of on the same page and share thoughts and, and feelings about what's working and what's not working so this was absolutely awesome yep. um we might have to get you back for another one for sure because i'm sure we have a ton more to talk about uh but in the last couple of minutes here i'm going to kind of roll out the red carpet for for you um where can people find admiral where can they find you are there any events that are upcoming if somebody wanted to to learn more about admiral and get get onboarded and started with you guys where would where would they go Sure. So uh, if you go to getadmiral.com, G-E-T, admiral.com, you'll you'll learn all about visitor relationship management and how we can deliver revenue. Like I said, it starts with a free tag. You, you should at least put that on your site and see what kind of revenue potential is sitting there. Uh, and then everything we do is, is performance-based. And so it's guaranteed net ROI for the publishers. You know, I would comment about the macro environment that we're in right now. Um, you know, I, having been in venture, I, I went through multiple, you know, market crashes, et, et cetera. <laughs> and, uh, you know, th- there's, there's this looming recession out there that publishers are talking to us about. And the beauty is our platform is like a Swiss army knife of new revenue, right? It's like, you know, you can pick up lost ad revenue that you were just burning up every single day. You can pick up, you know, e- email, uh, ad revenue, you can pick up donations and subscriptions and, you know, everything along um, that journey. When COVID first hit, same sort of thing happened and publishers were scrambling for revenue continuity. And Mm -hmm. really our ability to just turn on revenue without writing a single line of code was really valuable. So as we look forward over the next six, 12, 18 months, we're really looking to try to help publishers, again, just turn on revenue as quickly and easily as possible to to weather the storm. Yeah, that's that's really good to hear. And, And, you know, um, coming from a, a publisher ad server specifically, I, I, I know there's there's a, a big appetite in in the market right now for for exactly that, and especially you mentioned it you know, like a, a looming recession. I think the writing's kind of on the wall. We've seen in the tech industry, you know, layoffs happening. There's just been this downtick in in, in consumption and so forth. So I think. You know, you're absolutely right. Ways to empower publishers now to open up new revenue streams that maybe they didn't have before, or to just grow, you know, to, to grow what they they already have in place. I think is exactly the, the right direction. So, um, yeah. yeah, getadmiral.com. Uh, hopefully, anybody that's listening and if they've been intrigued by it, go check it out. Uh, Dan, it was an absolute pleasure to have you. I'm sure we'll have you back because this was great. Um, appreciate your time today, and uh, we'll hopefully hopefully talk to you very soon. Thanks, Rob. I loved it. I, I'd love to come back. See ya. Perfect. Take care.